Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandro Galeo, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. How we address health starts with how we think about health. How we think about health is shaped by our engagement with the broader conversation about the forces that shape it. It is through this process of engagement and debate that we deepen our understanding of these forces. These public health conversations are meant as spaces where we can have those discussions. We come together as a community to engage with speakers who can help guide our thinking. Thank you to everybody for joining us for today's conversation. And particularly thank you to those who made today happen, Alicia Noel and Meredith Brown. The COVID-19 pandemic upended our lives. It forced us to adapt to a new normal. Looking to a post-COVID-19 future, we now have a chance to shape the next normal. We can make the future radically healthier than the past, but only if we learn the lessons of the pandemic. These events aspire to help us do so. They are a chance to pause, to reflect, to inform our conversation about building a healthier world. During COVID-19, healthcare systems were at times overwhelmed by the burden of the pandemic. This elevated the importance of robust, responsive healthcare delivery systems. Today, we will explore how we can apply what we learned during the pandemic to shoring up these systems to shape healthy populations. Here to help guide this conversation is our moderator, Reed Abelson. Reed Abelson has been a reporter for New York Times since 1995. She currently the business of healthcare, focusing on health insurance and how financial incentives affect the delivery of medical care. Before she began, began covering healthcare in 2002, Ms. Abelson covered a broad range of topics from the collapse of Enron to the oversight of charitable organizations to accounting to personal investing. She was a staff writer for Smart Money from 1993 to 1995, where she wrote in-depth investing features. And from 1990 to 1993, she was a reporter for Forbes, where she profiled public and private companies. On a more personal note, I've always enjoyed reading Ms. Abelson's writing and learned from it. I'm now really pleased to turn the event over to Reed Abelson. Reed, over to you. Thank you so much. It's, it's really a privilege to be here. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, first, um, we will hear from Dr. Guy Bai, who is a joint appointment as an associate professor of accounting at John Hopkins Carey Business School and associate professor of health policy at management at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, she is an expert in healthcare pricing, policy and management. She has testified before the House Ways and Means Committee, written for the Wall Street Journal, no comment from me, and published um, numerous studies in academic journals. Then we will hear from Dr. Jerome Dugan, Assistant Professor of Health Services and the Leo Greenewalt Endowed Professor of Health Policy in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington, and an Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at UW. Dr. Dugan has expertise in modeling the financial and policy impacts of social and medical service interventions, evaluating the efficacy of cost containment strategies employed by payers and providers, and examining the structure and regulation of healthcare markets. We will then turn to Dr. Vivian Lee, president of Health Platforms at Ver Verily Life Sciences and author of The Long Fix, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis with Strategies that Work for Everyone. Prior to joining Verily, uh, Dr. Lee served as the Dean of the Medical School and Chief Executive of the University of Utah Healthcare, an integrated health system with a budget of nearly 4 billion, including 1,400 member physician groups and, and a health insurance plan. During her tenure, she led the University of Utah Health to its recognition for its healthcare delivery system innovations that enabled better quality of care at lower cost with high patient satisfaction and strong financial performance. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Peter Shin, an associate professor of health policy and management at the George Washington University and Gibson Program in Community Health Policy and RCHN Community Health Foundation Research Director. Dr. Shen focuses on the study of community health systems and integration of care for vulnerable populations and has authored over 100 health policy reports and articles in, on community health centers, the healthcare safety net, medically underserved populations, healthcare financing, social determinants and health information technology. His research focuses on identifying innovative payment and healthcare delivery models, exploring population health initiatives and assessing impacts of policy change. Dr. Bai, if you'd like to start. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Abelson. Thank you everyone, uh, especially thank you 
uh, Dean Lei. This is a great opportunity. I'm really honored to join everyone. So let me share my slide. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I, I am a accounting professor and I also have a joint appointment at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management. So my research is really using the bean counting skill, right? As an accountant, as a CPA, using the bean counting skill to study the interdisciplinary ideas, uh, topics, you know, health policy, management, and accounting. So today I'm going to focus on three of my public published studies uh, to to give us um, you know, some kind of overview, at least from a bean counting perspective on hospital finance and the healthcare. So this is a 2015 article published by you know, me and uh, Gerard Anderson, my colleague at Johns Hopkins. It's about extreme markup in hospital. So markup is how much a hospital's charge, which is unilaterally determined by hospital over the patient care cost. So a higher charge markup means the hospital would start with a high price in all kinds of negotiation with private insurance. So we found among the three or 4,000 hospitals in the US in 2012, the data is from 2012, 50 hospitals have over 10 times charge to cost ratio, okay, charge divided by cost. And then among the 50 hospitals, 49 of them are actually for-profit. So these profit, so these for-profit hospitals have a strong profiteering motivation. So they charge a lot of money. And it was, uh, uh, we were very lucky the New York Times wrote editorial um, to, you know, to introduce that study. So they charge very high, right, in hospital in order to gain a lot of revenue from commercially insured patients. Then how about the actual negotiate the price? Right? The chart is not the actual negotiate the price. It's only a starting point for negotiation. So this is the study we just published three days ago on radiology. So with you know, my colleague in Michigan State University, Martin McCurry, my colleague in Johns Hopkins. So we found um, among the 13 shoppable services. So if you are familiar with the hospital transparency rule, you would know that from January 1st this year, all US hospitals must disclose their price, especially commercially negotiate the price for 300 services. Among the 300, the CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, require 75 of them. And then among the 75, there are 13 radiology services. These are very common standard, um, generic, to me, it's generic services, very comparable across hospitals. So let's look at the actual negotiated price. So we found, you know, the median negotiated price is several times our Medicare price, but that's not the key finding. The key finding is between hospitals, look at the negotiated price can be 10 times this spread. So let's say hospital one have a median negotiated price of $100, Another hospital can have $1,000. These are not the cost. These are not the charge. These are literally negotiate the price. So someone's leaving the money on the table, right? So Wall Street Journal run a, um, a, a report, a story uh, to, on, on the thirties regarding this story. Cause you know, we, this is the very first time using the negotiate the price information. We document how much is the variation for the standard standard comparable um, services, how much the variation is on the US hospital market. Therefore, our conclusion is the hospitals are able to extract a lot of rent, right? A lot of revenue from commercial payers. Then how about their spending? So this is, um, yeah, this is just another related, um, related study um, published in this year on House of the Bronx, looking at the colonoscopy. So there's again, huge variation in colonoscopy they negotiate the price. So next, let's look at the spending. So this is my expertise on charity care. You know, we have about two thirds of hospitals in the United States are operated as nonprofit. Nonprofit simply means they are exempted from federal, state tax, property tax, sales tax, right? They enjoy this great 
uh, tax exemption status, but they, they can still make money. They just cannot distribute it to shareholders. There's no shareholders. But then the taxpayers have the right to ask, are those nonprofit hospitals provide enough charity care to justify their tax exempt status, right? Because we as taxpayers are subsidizing these hospitals. So we published with my several colleagues in Johns Hopkins University, we published a study this year on health affairs regarding the comparison of charity care among nonprofit, for-profit, and government hospitals. So what's charity care? Charity care is you know, provide free care to financially disadvantaged patients. So you, once you give them care, you don't go after them to collect the bill. That's charity care. So what we found is quite striking. The nonprofit hospitals, look at the blue line, the blue bar, the nonprofit hospitals actually in aggregation provide the least amount of charity care among nonprofit, for-profit, and government hospitals. And then we look at some, some areas that have all three types of hospitals together. And we found, guess what? In many of those areas, the for-profit hospitals provide the most charity care. And then in, in these areas, about, you know, the they for-profit hospitals actually provide more than government hospital or nonprofit hospitals. So the myth that nonprofit hospitals are providing more charity care than other type of hospitals is wrong. And this was covered on New York, uh, on Washington Post. Um, because you know, this is really a surprising finding to, to many. So let me just summarize. I want to use what I got quoted on Wall Street Journal on Tuesday. What would I have done you know, in the past you know, a decade in my work in the healthcare policy um, and management, especially in the hospital area, is this. We have a situation. We have a system, especially in hospital, very, very far away from a competitive market. And the hospitals are still staying a black box. And many parties are using the black box to extract a lot of profits from consumers, you know, the payers, the third party payers, the employers, and individual patients. And it's not clear how much benefit the individual consumers already you know, got it. And we, there's a very long way for us to go to move our market to a more efficient situation. So that, that's, my, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, Dr. Dugan? Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. And so today I don't have a slide deck, but I thought I'd talk um, very generally about what's been happening in the healthcare space during the pandemic and maybe some ways that we can um, help uh, uh, the health system move forward um, following this pandemic um, when it ultimately ends. So the pandemic has really kind of pushed hospital resources to its edge, but for a very long time now, there's been long standing challenges for delivering vital services in communities in the United States. Um, these challenges are particularly acute in urban safety net and rural uh, critical access hospitals, which have struggled for a long time to meet the needs of low income communities and also uh, communities of color. Um, many like to say or point out the fact that these issues are attributable to financing challenges due to our legacy system of healthcare finance. Uh, but a major challenge, uh, or rather a major driver to these um, struggles are also attributable to unmet social determinant of health needs related to nutrition, for example, housing, income, or environment. Uh, that disproportionately impact communities in poverty and also communities of color and contribute to adverse payer mixes within hospitals, which um, hurts them in their bottom line. Um, when the pandemic ultimately started to ramp up, uh, hospitals found themselves uh, facing government recommendations to cancel or delay elective surgeries, non-emergency medical care, uh, surgical procedures and uh, dental procedures as well. And the main goal of this policy was to help conserve resources, uh, free up hospital beds, and also personnel to help treat uh, a surge in COVID patients. At the same time, hospitals were really forced to reorganize uh, their activity, acquire new uh, equipment, and also the staff to handle this kind of massive shift from normal operations to dealing with uh, COVID. 
Um, altering a hospital's technology um, for producing care um, immediately positioned them to deal with surge in COVID patients. However, these operational decisions ultimately led to um, immediate losses in, in revenue. Um, through the duration of the pandemic, um, many hospitals have faced bankruptcy. Um, we've witnessed closures, especially in rural areas, and also outside of hospitals, the closure of indiv individual practices. Uh, while the CARES Act went a very long way in dampening the impact and reducing operating losses, hospitals still did struggle uh, quite a bit early in the pandemic and also uh, now. Um, thinking about patients for a moment, um, changes in hospitals uh, due to the pandemic also led to delays in avoidance of care um, by individual patients who were going out to seek care, um, in large part due to fear of infections. Uh, a recent study by the CDC kind of reported the fact that 41% of adults delayed care or avoided care uh, altogether. Um, and in particular, uh, emergency services and routine services. Uh, all, fortunately, um, these trends were largely concentrated among um, unpaid caregivers, uh, persons dealing with chronic conditions, and minority groups like Blacks and Hispanics. And, and this is a major challenge because delayed care leads to worse outcomes later on. It's very difficult to take a patient who's suffering from cancer, for example, or cardiovascular disease or COPD uh, to avoid care without facing major consequences or costs later. And these costs are definitely to the individual, um, but also to the provider. Um, it's also important, and I'd be remiss to not mention the fact that in addition to dealing with the pandemic, we also dealt with a pretty large economic recession uh, which led to massive job losses. Um, and this ultimately led to many people without insurance. And this kind of further led to challenges related to um, individuals being able to properly finance care. Uh, so if I was going to make a, a comment on what we can do moving forward past the pandemic, uh, I, I'd say I have three points. Uh, first, um, we can continue this um, slow migration we've been having away from activity-based reimbursement to value-based reimbursements, um, a focus on quality of care delivered over volume, lines the delivery of care with need, not just now, but also going into the future. And this ultimately will lead to improvements in population health. Uh, furthermore, if we focus on using equity-focused metrics that are incorporated within these value-based models of reimbursement, uh, this can have an incredible, uh, incredible impact on disparities in care uh, for addressing disparities in care uh, delivery and, and outcomes. Um, one of the other comments that I'll make related to moving to a value-based system has to do with the fact that uh, shifting our system to a value-based uh, from a volume-based system will be costly. And because um, many low resource hospitals that are critical access hospitals or safety net hospitals don't necessarily have the capital resources available to kind of finance these transitions, uh, there's a potential role of the government to step in to um, help accelerate that change. Uh, lastly, I'll comment on the fact that under the CARES Act, there was an acceleration in reimbursement for medical services. Um, this had a positive impact on the timeliness of reimbursement, which helped hospitals. And then lastly, I'll mention uh, the fact that uh, telemedicine was a huge innovation during this pandemic, um, but an even larger innovation was the fact that reimbursements were increased, not only from government reimbursements for um, visits, but also among uh, private payers. And so um, those are the comments that I would make about um, how we should think about moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was again. That was very interesting and, and obviously a very different perspective. Uh, Dr. Lee. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I do have a few slides, and I'll be building on some of the comments of the previous speakers, especially Dr. Dugan. Let's see. So as was mentioned in the introduction, I um, 
have had a long history in academic medicine for most of my career, but in the last three and a half years moved over to the technology side and now work at Verily, which is uh, Alphabet's healthcare and life sciences company. And um, I really appreciate the framing of this discussion and thank Dean Galea for inviting me to be a part of this, this idea of the next normal, really challenging us to think about um, the opportunities in, emanating from this crisis. You know, how can we really um, reimagine how healthcare really ought to be in this country? And the framework that I wanna talk about today is this idea of co-producing health. And the context I think most of us on this call are probably very familiar with, which is this crisis that we were already in the midst of before the pandemic, the ways in which our country is a remarkable outlier compared to most other high income nations, both in terms of the costs of care, as well as the remarkably poor outcomes, despite those costs. And of course, underlying a lot of those um, underlying a lot of that poor outcome showing has really been um, worsening equity issues in this country. And it's just, everything's gotten even worse with the pandemic. So the latest life expectancy data from 2020 showing that life expectancy on average in this country is projected to have declined by another year and a half. So clearly uh, in terms of a legacy that we are leaving to our children and to next generations, this, this is something that is uh, absolutely, we have to start to address. And so the framework that I wanted to talk about is this idea of co-producing health that people have termed. And it, it really is anchored in this notion that despite our focus on healthcare delivery systems, um, where I grew up um, for most of my career, we do realize that uh, when we think about the determinants of health, really what happens in clinics and hospitals is only a small proportion of that. And much more important are health behaviors, as well as public health uh, considerations and socioeconomic factors. And if we have that, um, keep that in mind, and then I think it uh, lays the foundation for us to think about a different way of approaching how we deliver healthcare and how we think about achieving better health for our population. And this is this idea of co-producing health. And I wanna credit Marin and Paul Batalden, who wrote this really fantastic paper in BMJ, Quality and Safety. And uh, they drew my attention to some of this work by Victor Fuchs, who's an economist, um, who wrote about this transformation in the US economy from a manufacturing-based economy to more of a service-based economy. In, in the post-war period, you know, we we're really focused on making cars and refrigerators and all the amenities of uh, the American household. And he predicted that we would evolve to a service-based economy, and he was correct there and that the implications of that evolution from a manufacturing-based economy to service-based economy were that our relationship as consumers with the producers of the goods and services would be very different. And the parallels are true in healthcare as well. So if we think about, for example, in banking, traditionally in banking, we would go into the branches and really rely very much on the bankers to manage our overall financial health. You'd have to go in and ask about your, your balance and deposit a check and so on and so forth. And with the digital uh, transformation, we're seeing much more of this idea of co-producing our financial health. We are able to manage our finances at home, online, can practically get a loan within 30 minutes or uh, within maybe even 30 seconds uh, online these days. And so we see the financial sector really moving from a manufacturing financial health kind of model and relationship with consumers to one where we're really co-producing. And how do we extend that same thinking now to healthcare? Where I would posit that traditionally as, as our clinical trainees, as our medical students and others practice in the high-end tertiary quaternary healthcare systems, I think often we lose sight of this idea of co-production and focus too much on the manufacturing idea. So what does that mean in terms of health? Well, it's really about empowering people to engage with their own health. And in this particular case, is, is uh, really has the potential to be accelerated just like in banking with uh, digital advances. Now we've seen with the pandemic, um, another very important um, change that is concurrent with this digital one, which is the, engagement of employers in thinking about employee health. And as you will recall, 
um, in the US, about half of all Americans receive their healthcare coverage through their employers. So this is a very important um, change that is undertaken. So, or that is underway. And what we're seeing is that employers now are much more focused on health and the health of their employees than ever. They've been responsible for trying to keep COVID down in order to maintain the business viability. Uh, verily, we have a business that's focused on this with um, COVID testing and vaccine tracking and so on and so forth. So we've been right in the heart of this. And we've seen new uh, uses of, for example, public health data about COVID prevalence applied to the worksite to enable employers to think more proactively about how to keep their workforce healthy. And this thinking has extended, of course, beyond just COVID, recognizing that uh, the employees that are most vulnerable to COVID are those who have had chronic conditions. And that reminds us of just how uh, common chronic conditions are and what a significant productivity and financial impact their health has in the workplace. So this is an older paper, but really a landmark paper uh, that looked at the overall loss of productivity in people with these kinds of chronic diseases that are all of a sudden now really uh, of focus among employers. And then with the pandemic, um, as has been already alluded to, there's been a significant um, decline in, in access to care. And that reduction in primary care and preventative care is even more concerning. And so in this environment of uh, thinking about how technology can enhance the co-production of health, we are seeing, first of all, um, telehealth really take off, as Dr. Dugan just alluded to. Um, I'm a radiologist by training, and so for years we struggled with just getting, um, being able to interpret MRIs from multiple different states without having uh, being credentialed in those states. It was such a challenge. And then, you know, literally overnight with the pandemic, those rules and regulations transformed. But beyond telehealth, there's a huge opportunity to do more than just simply talking with your clinician or your provider. There are real opportunities to use uh, digital devices, remote patient monitoring and other technologies. So I thought I'd spend the last couple of minutes just um, highlighting a few examples of how this is really working to enable the co-production of health. And one is an example called Pivot. Uh, this was a company started by a medical school classmate of mine, a head and neck surgeon, who's really focused on how to uh, help people stop smoking and really prevent those cancers that he was um, uh, that he had to treat for so much of his career. So if you look at this. Uh, product. There is the little black device as a carbon monoxide monitor. So you blow into that device, it gives an estimate of the carbon monoxide in your blood, transmits that to your phone, and there are a whole bunch of uh, behavioral interventions to encourage people to spread out the time between cigarettes and uh, ultimately quit smoking. A second example is one that is from a portfolio company on a um, our platforms at Verily, this is on Duo, very similar to other platforms, so I use them as an example. And in th this particular case, we're looking at individuals who have chronic conditions, um, say diabetes in this case. Again, there's a device, a continuous glucose monitor in this case that estimates blood sugar. And now, for the first time ever, patients can make a visual association between the meals that they're eating on their phone, they can take pictures of the meals, and the impact of those meals, their exercise, their sleep on their blood sugar. Combined with telehealth, with coaches and clinicians, um, most of the, the leading businesses in this field are showing a significant improvement in blood sugar management and blood pressure and so on. And then the third example is uh, Thrive. This is Arianna Huffington's company. Th this uh, company uses input of individuals in their phones and their own social, personal, financial goals, for example, mental well-being goals, and again, uses a lot of those behavioral psychology interventions to help people achieve, uh, achieve those goals and feel more empowered about how they manage their own health. Taken together, this, the models that we're seeing in digital health are really about collecting data, organizing that data in a meaningful way, and then really personalizing the interaction with people to enable their activation, to enable 
healthier behaviors. And to create a personalized experience that bridges across cultures, bridges across socioeconomic bridge backgrounds, and really enables a personalized experience. And in that, uh, in my last slide, I wanted to just mention that there are additional opportunities in this model of tech-enabled co-production as part of the, the next normal that I think are just really important to mention, which includes some things that Dr. Dugan um, and um, Gabay alluded to, which are, first, we have the opportunity to move away from a fee-for-service model of care instead of paying per click we can expect our digital technologies to be paid for based on their ability to improve health, paying for value, paying for reductions in blood pressure, reductions in uh, blood sugar, for example. We can set a higher expectation in terms of the evidence that they have to provide in order to be reimbursed. And then thirdly, we can set expectations around personalization, uh, health equity, and accessibility. I think these are three great opportunities for us to reimagine the next normal so that we can have a legacy to leave to future generations that we can be proud of. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Back to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and now um, if uh, Dr. Shin, Great. Um, thank you for uh, for uh, the introduction. And uh, as the last speaker, I, I took a, a lot of notes. Um, hopefully, just try to also tie in a lot of things I think are sort of similar um, in terms of some of the cross cutting themes. Um, but uh, let me start with um, first you know, the sort of the focus of, of my um, presentation, which is about community health centers. And community he health centers is really again about the word community. Um, um, it's a it's a program that was started by uh, doctors Jack Geiger and um, Count Gibson uh, back in the 1960s um, when uh, welfare reform was happening with Medicaid and all those um, kind of um, uh, great novel innovations and in, in coverage and access. Um, and actually, it's a model that came from South Africa. Um, Dr. Geiger saw how empowered and how engaged the community was in terms of not only addressing a lot of the direct health issues, uh, but a lot of the underlying what we are now calling uh, social determinants or social factors uh, that play into that. Um, and today, um, you know, there's now about 1400 uh, health centers that are across about 1400 sites. Um, and uh, much of them are in sort of inner city or very impoverished uh, urban areas, but a lot of them also are in these rural and remote communities. They serve about 30 million uh, patients um, and have tons of visits. And, and it's really one of the probably the largest and probably the only um, uh, national healthcare, primary healthcare system uh, for this population. Um, and the population being, um, and I'll get back to the, the population being really largely um, uh, low income, uh, about nine out of 10 patients have incomes less than 200% of the federal poverty level. Uh, two out of three patients are non-white. Um, and uh, for, for in terms of age distribution, a, a lot of them are, of course, um, sort of similar to the U.S. population um, in terms of their, their age breakouts. Uh, but one of the things you want to know and try to always think about is, well, how do they differ uh, really with the rest of the general population? Um, and health centers here, as um, uh, when we compare them against the census, is that, you know, they're about three times more likely to be poor um, and a lot of the majority of health center patients because they are, are in impoverished areas uh, tend to rely on public coverage, particularly Medicaid, uh, and a sizable proportion also are uninsured. Um, and one of the key aspects about health centers is uh, why did the population look like this? What is, you know, sort of how are health centers, uh, the program supposed to be working? And one of the um, key legislative aspects or mandates is that community health centers have to be 
located in federally designated medically underserved communities or serving uh, medically underserved populations. Um, and that means basically they're in resource poor communities, um, very high level of poverty, uh, a lot of uh, poor health uh, indicators um, that are evident for this kind of need for uh, basic preventive uh, services. Um, and it's a program that's administered by HRSA and the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. Um, and also because of their uh, special status, uh, they do receive what we call a, a federally qualified health center uh, payment model, uh, which is basically uh, a bundled uh, encounter rate uh, for, uh, for seeing uh, Medicaid and, and Medicare patients. Um, and it, it tends to be a, uh, somewhat of an enhanced rate that you would get uh, as opposed to being in a fee for traditional fee for service system. Um, but why aren't there more health centers? Um, well, there's a lot of requirements for being a community health center. Um, the, major, uh, the majority of their governing board actually has to be actual patients of the health center or be community representatives. Um, and so just to uh, Dr. Lee's point that, um, you know, we're talking about empowering communities here to really sort of advocate for their own health care and social needs. Um, it's also a program that has to serve anybody that comes to the door. Um, it's not necessarily a, a free clinic. Uh, there is a sliding fee uh, based on income. So sometimes they'll just pay a couple dollars or five dollars. So, so, um, so basically paying, being able to pay what they can. Um, they also provide a comprehensive range of uh, primary health care, including dental and vision, um, and include what is traditionally called enabling services, uh, but kind of roughly translates to addressing some of the social factors uh, that plays into uh, why some patients uh, may not be able to easily access care, uh, whether it's providing transportation, uh, language services, um, or even uh, basically uh, uh, basic uh, case management as well. Um, it's also uh, uh, very accountable in terms of being having to monitor itself in terms of its performance um, and reporting those measures to HRSA and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. Um, and, and these are some of the key quality indicators that um, NCQA um, uh, uh, provides. Uh, so it, it, it is nationally comparable in, in many ways. And, and when you look at the data, um, you'll see that health centers often exceed a lot of those uh, benchmarks um, that you might see on the private side. Uh, so when, when you, if you ever have a chance to visit a community health center, you see that it is relatively state of the art. So it's, it doesn't look anything like what people sometimes imagine as being a poor people's clinic and which is not um, because it's very, very much enhanced and advanced in, in terms of the way uh, that they really try to meet the needs of, the, of this population. Um, and, and, I, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, uh, you know, one of their key um, mission is to sort of help address and mitigate a, a lot of the health disparities. Um, and, as, and as I showed before, when you compare that to the U.S. population, uh, that the majority, again, of, of health center patients tend to be um, non non white. Um, and because um, you know. Just to sort of emphasize the point that uh, when you are in a medically underserved community um, and you have a lot of uh, poverty that sort of affects health, um, it's not surprising to find that health centers tend to have uh, patients who, with a higher risk of poor health, uh, especially when you compare them against private practices. And the great thing about health centers is it's pretty well recognized. I mean, it has bipartisan support. Um, and has had pretty good investments made by the federal government. Um, and you can see here that, uh, that health centers have grown tremendously um, just from 2000 um, uh, when this data was available. Um, and, um, and we went from about 10 million to now about 30 million. Um, and what you'll find is that when the ACA was implemented um, and you saw the Medicaid expansions come into play, uh, that you saw a steep rise in the Medicaid population uh, or patients at the health centers um, and a significant decrease um, in the uninsured, which is what we had expected. Uh, but as you can see around 2020, there was a dip. Um, and guess why? Um, obviously it's because of, of the pandemic uh, that came into play. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the health centers could not obviously operate like a lot of the uh, other practices. Um, 
and I'll get to that uh, in a minute. But uh, but one of the things that we wanted to um, uh, sort of showcase as Congress was uh, thinking about funding for health centers um, is um, you know that over this time frame that health centers have significant losses. Uh, about $5 billion just from April to March over one year's uh, span. Um, and again, you know, we're talking about federal grants being one of the major lifeblood revenues for, uh, for health center operations. Um, it's a big, big hit. Um, and, and health centers, again, being in communities where sometimes they're the only source of care uh, for uh, the, the population. Um, and the other part, of their revenue that is critical and they're very sensitive to it is Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid represents 40% of their revenues um, and um, any changes to how, how uh, states work with eligibility um, or with payment or even scope of services significantly impact what health centers can do. Um, and, and particularly in terms of, you know, if we're talking about um, uh, uh, health centers that are nonprofit um, has only about three months of reserves um, and very thin margins um, and are sort of working to really make sure that they're serving a hard to serve, a hard to reach population. And as I mentioned before, um, that one of the great things about health centers is that they're very prepared. They're prepared to, um, uh, to engage in, in various factors. Um, and when, um, you know, meaningful use and HIT was sort of the buzz at that time, health centers were right on it. Um, they, they operate very much with the incentive of doing what they can for uh, the population and making sure that they can enhance the quality of care and also improve access to care. Um, and today, about almost all of them have some sort of EMR installed at across 14,000 sites. Okay. Um, a lot of them do collect data on social risk factors. They do screenings, um, and 43% have used telemedicine. So they were very much prepared in terms of engaging um, um, uh, health centers, um, uh, uh, at least in terms of virtual visits. Um, obviously, a lot of the dental visits went on, but uh, they were able to sort of increase uh, their percentages at the early start of the pandemic. Uh, about half of their visits were virtual at the time um, and have still steadily over this time frame uh, gone in person, but uh, they were very much uh, sort of ahead uh, compared to most primary care practices in terms of engaging their uh, patient population. Um, and, and I think to uh, Dr. Dugan's point, you know, uh, again, a lot of the health centers are in communities of color. They are very much um, uh, following the mission of really trying to uh, hit and serve the uh, hard to serve populations. Um, and you'll see here that the majority of patients who got the first vaccine or completed them, the majority of them are non-white. Um, so they do really go out and really try to get uh, the population that um, uh, that, you know, like the New York Times had identified, uh, was, was large, disproportionately affected. Um, but there are still significant problems um, in terms of making sure that they can really get the population to come in to get their vaccines. And it's not surprising to find one third of health centers uh, reported that uh, you know, there were significant hesitancy issues um, um, but at the same time, uh, we do know that one third of them were very successful in terms of being able to reach uh, their service area and, and meeting the community needs for the vaccine. And that's one of the research questions we'll have is just to figure out you know, how they were able to really get um, out there and get their outreach done, uh, bring their patients in and, and have them complete their vaccinations. Um, um, and, um, and a couple of the other uh, big ticket items were about the staffing. Uh, sometimes it, a lot of health centers being where they are have significant recruitment retention issues um, and really do try to think about how to use the, the best of their staffing. Um, so they do a lot of this, what we call team-based or panel uh, services uh, for the patients as they come in and just to make sure that you know, even if they don't have an appointment, they can see them on the day. Um, if there are other services that they need, that those services are co-located -loc um, at their sites as well. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, some, uh, some sort of wrap up 
items um, as we are thinking about what we're calling the next normal. I think so, a lot of the challenges are still the same um, given where they are. Um, health centers are looking for some financial and operational sustainability, uh, thinking about how they can still remain resilient. Um, um, and we saw from the CARES Act all the way through the America Rescue Plan um, and currently um, in the proposed uh, Build Back Better um, bill that, uh, that there are significant funding for health centers, very significant support for health centers. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a push to get away from volume-based uh, encounter rates um, and, and more towards value-based arrangements. Uh, so there's a lot of discussions of how that might look, um, especially given the financial vulnerability of health centers and the places that they work. Uh, they will continue to play a central role in addressing public health concerns. Um, uh, another big item for them right now is to, think, is to also think about some of the issues around the opioid epidemic. Um, as I mentioned before, they are a critical player um, in terms of social determinants and health equity. Um, and uh, I think to the earlier speaker's point of, you know, there's a lot of hospitals that um, and providers that have sort of gone under or had to reduce services. Um, and and if in places where health centers are, and it's already sort of health center or health resources poor, uh, it's devastating um, and have to figure out how to get health centers um, to really sort of pick up that slack, um, you know, whether it's family planning or other kinds of uh, services that might have become uh, more difficult to access. Uh, one of the general issues that health centers have always had is, is the lack of access to specialty care. Uh, they are in this business of providing primary care. Some of them do hire some uh, special specialists, um, but, uh, but for the lack of a better word, they're not as well integrated with the broad, broader healthcare system. Um, and so they have uh, significant problems uh, trying to get access for their patients, particularly their uninsured population, of course. Um, and, and, and in general, uh, the future always is sort of this dichotomy of, uh, you know, are they able to expand their services, uh, expand their footprint, uh, get people more in. Um, and um, as they look for more funding, as they think about, you know, our health, our, will states be expanding the Medicaid programs or they will be cutting back eligibility or cutting back uh, the payment models? Uh, will they have to sort of balance that against whether they have to reduce certain services or even close some of their sites? Uh, so I don't know. Um, I know the, the big theme of this discussion is about thinking about the the new normal, um, but I think for health centers, they have always sort of thought about, you know, what it means to have a better normal um, in many ways. Thank you for that. Great, thank you so much. So um, I, I was, this was all very interesting and I was struck in a way that the question um, that came to my mind so clearly was, you know, who's normal, right? Who, who's next normal are we speaking of? Um, I thought Dr. Bai's uh, points about, um, you know, how wealthy um, some hospitals are and how much money they're making versus Dr. Dugan's how little <laughs> uh, money some providers are making and even the patients, I mean, Dr. Lee, um, talking about patients with access to employer provided services um, versus those that may not have those as, as clearly as robust uh, services um, who are going to community um, centers. So um, I, I wanna open it exactly at, at that, which is if you would all just sort of talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you, how you think about a system that is so bifurcated in predicting both what should be done and, and what will happen. I'll, I'll start with Dr. Bai since she represented the wealthy. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I, uh, first of all, uh, you know, we are doing a study looking at the financial impact of COVID on hospitals, looking at very new uh, data disclosure. Guess what? The overall financial viability of hospitals are not being affected. Their operating margin dropped, but guess what? They got a lot of money from the government, right? And local, not just the federal, but also states. 
So their budget actually is stable. Um, hopefully we can get published soon. So the point is, you know, um, I going forward, I think we should be concerned that the very powerful connect, politically connected big players, including hospitals, including physicians, home physician groups, and insurance companies, they might capture regulation legislation to, you know, in the, in, on the surface, they are helping patients, but actually they are helping themselves. Um, so there are many, many such, uh, such examples. You know, we published a study on lobbying. Guess what? You know, be, uh, last you know, 2020, at the end of 2020, then we are having this uh, you know, COVID and then the, um, the, high, the highest spender on lobbying, sorry, actually beginning of 2021, the highest uh, spender on, on COVID related legislation on lobbying is actually American Hospital Association, American Medical Association, and then pharma, it's a trade association of the manufacturers. So I think, you know, going forward, we should be careful that, uh, that the powerful parties are not using COVID and creating an environment that will benefit themselves, but not patients, and then at the expense of taxpayers and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, well, Dr. Dugan, though, I mean, uh, it, to the extent that there are struggling providers, I mean, well, what's your sense about how to how do we sort of, you know, balance this, right? So that we're not giving away to, you know, all these folks who may not need giving, but in fact are, are helping, you know, the, the institutions or providers that really need it. Yeah, so one of the comments that I'll make is that you know, most hospitals face a number of kind of known challenges um, with kind of staying afloat. And, and for these institutions, they are aligned with wanting to improve the health of the individual patients they serve and also the communities, but there, there is a bottom line. Um, so when we think about the challenges in general facing hospitals, we have to think about uh, cost growth in particular for staff and supplies. Um, hospitals, especially um, safety net hospitals, operate on very thin margins. And in part, these thin margins are attributable to uh, lower reimbursement rates from Medicaid and Medicare, um, especially when it comes to these reimbursements. They've been low for years, and the timeliness of these reimbursements have been a huge challenge to organizations that, that are resource constrained. Um, integrating technology, while it's a, a great tool for improving overall hospital operations and engaging with patients, it is very expensive. And when you deal with uh, hospitals that have very, uh, don't have um, as many pathways as private hospitals to raise capital resources to make these investments, um, again, it can be very hard for them to pivot and move forward. Uh, lastly, um, and I think it's pretty well known among this entire group, uh, uncollected debts are a huge problem, even in the face of, uh, of having um, the ACA pass and, and Medicaid expansions that have occurred. Um, these expansions weren't even across states. Uh, the uptake rate, while it's been high, hasn't been that great um, or as great as what, what we originally intended to be. And because of certain decisions that were made by uh, the last administration, we've actually seen kind of declines in, in the actual uh, communities that are covered. So, so when I made comments about the fact that we should think about moving forward towards a value-based model, um, it's not simply to say that we can kind of flip a switch and move over to that system. Um, presently in the marketplace right now, there's misaligned incentives between uh, payers, providers, um, and, and, and patients with who gets to kind of collect the value. Um, some institutions don't need that much value to kind of incentivize themselves to shift to a new model, but, but others need a lot more. Um, I definitely think there's a role for the government to step in and help with that transformation. Um, many of us who've kind of looked at health history have seen uh, acts like the Hill-Burton Act were incredibly transformative with kind of increasing hospital capacity and new facilities within communities. Um, but one could think that having um, legislation either at the state or federal level that's focused on kind of improving technology and, and, and kind of accelerating this kind of shift from um, volume-based to, to value-based reimbursement and, and, and paying for it for many of these institutions um, could, could greatly kind of improve 
uh, the quality of health and, and the financial performance of hospitals uh, all the way through. But, but the devil is, is, is not in kind of one system versus another. We know other systems are better, um, but the challenge is how do you actually practically transition into a new system? Um, if it was easy, we would have already done it. That, that's certainly fair. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, um, you know, uh, segueing in terms of sort of the, the technology and, and sort of, um, you know, some of the digital things that you talked about. I'm curious, again, how, how do you make sure that those tools are applied equally, right? How, how do you make sure that they don't worsen inequity um, and actually, you know, improve access? And I, I realize it's not a magic wand, so. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it's a great question you're asking. Um, and maybe just to backtrack to the question that you asked earlier too, because it's sort of in that context, I think that there, we have seen, um, and I've been sort of following this national trend, which is the country's appetite for making healthcare, you know, universal access to healthcare a, a priority. And of course, as, as, uh, as we all know, the Affordable Care Act made significant advances, but there's been uh, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, unevenness um, across the country, as Dr. Dubin alluded to also. And so what we're seeing though, is that as we are increasingly shifting the financial responsibility to individuals, uh, for example, the Commonwealth Fund put out a report maybe a year or so ago that showed that about 42% of Americans, I believe, are underinsured, meaning that they um, have to spend up to or beyond 10% of their income on their health care. Um, that we're seeing more and more Americans in, say, Gallup polls and Pew polls, um, supportive of uh, universal access to healthcare, to basic healthcare, and I think that's an absolutely critical step to um, to moving away from that bimodal distribution um, of American health to to better health. From a tech point of view, it's uh, it's been very important for us and part of the reason why I'm in the technology sector and bringing colleagues from the healthcare environment in to ensure that we partner with um, organizations that represent the people that we're trying to serve. So in technology, tech, you know, most tech companies do not run hospitals, we don't run clinics. So all of the building of our technologies and our apps and our programs are done in collaboration with health systems. And so that's been a, a very strong mantra for us as well. If we're going to be building this technology to serve the broader population, then we need to be partnering with um, a wide range of communities so that we can build uh, accordingly. The technology itself, there's nothing inherently more equitable or less equitable in it, except for access to, you know, actually access to the, uh, um, having the bandwidth and access um, to the internet. But beyond that, and of course, there's effort now in the Build Back Better, there's sort of money, hopefully, that will make that um, address a lot of that problem. Um, but what we're finding is that, you know, the, what the technology can do very well is to create a very personalized experience and to stop, you know, when I was in medical school, everybody, every patient was a 70 kilogram white male. That was sort of the model that we used, you know, um, but now you don't have to be a 70 kilogram white male. You can be whatever you are and the technology can sort of measure your blood sugar, measure your carbon monoxide, whatever it is, and sort of titrate the care to you and even and also titrate the way or adjust the way the technology interacts with you and motivates you and encourages you um, and even the language that it speaks to you. And so we do have the opportunity, I think, to leapfrog a lot of the inherent biases and, and inequities that are in our healthcare system, if we do it right. It doesn't, it won't naturally happen that way, but we, we have to work on it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and Dr. Shin, I mean, you also mentioned obviously the use of technology, but also the losses being faced by um, community health centers. And so I'm curious, I mean, from your perspective, you know, to what extent is the kind of investment necessary um, I mean, I, I believe you when you said that, you know, uh, a lot of these centers are really sort of uh, much more modern and sort of up to date than people expect. But uh, what kind of investment is necessary to make sure that, you know, we address some of the inequities um, revealed by the pandemic? Well, I think there's a, a couple of things. One is the, the technology itself. Um, I think everybody has a good handle on what kind of information is useful as they collect them. That information is not necessarily shared, or is it updated as they, as patients move from one provider to another? And if you're thinking about 
what we are now calling social determinant uh, efforts to make that part of the new normal and really being able to address that. You know, we need a lot more in terms of digital connections with those community providers uh, that will also be able to update and make sure that we're closing the loop on, on whether those uh, patients got the services that they needed, whether it was food, housing, uh, transportation. So there has to be a way of really fully leveraging the technology uh, to, to really monitor uh, that, the, that the care delivery model is really working. Um, and we do have some examples of some of the managed care organizations now trying to play more uh, part in terms of bridging that kind of effort. Um, but, but I think right now we're sort of in the space of a lot more needs to be done to bring people together and to really fortify and strengthen those connections. That's, that's very interesting. So we're going to take, and I'm going to encourage everyone to, um, you know, please uh, submit questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, there was one, I guess, about uh, value-based purchasing, you know, that it's obviously very important. Um, how can we empower patients to be responsible for their health? Does anyone want to take a swing, Dr. Lee? Sure. I I think it's actually, it was when I was doing research for my book, I was really surprised at some of the numbers because most of us think um, that either, you know, if we're on a government program or if we're covered by our employer, that, you know, they're really covering our healthcare. But in fact, actually, there's been really a remarkable and persistent trend to shifting the, that financial responsibility to us already. So uh, today about uh, for Americans who are covered by their employers, the employee themselves is covering about 30% of those healthcare costs, and it's continued to rise. About 75% are in high cost, uh, are in high deductible health plans actually now. So, you know, the first several thousand dollars could be um, your responsibility. So I think even today already, uh, we indiv as individuals now, I'm not speaking as, um, as, uh, as a person rather than as a healthcare provider, um, we are already responsible for our healthcare costs. And um, I think that's kind of one realization that's, that's really important. We, I, I was just earlier on a, on a panel uh, talking with some folks from CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and they're really trying to imagine uh, new ways of thinking about value-based payment. And one of the ones that I'm encouraging is to uh, reimagine these quality-based metrics to be, instead of putting all the responsibility on, say, a provider system, really think of it more as a team sport, which won't surprise you given my theme about co-production, but it really requires both the clinician and the patient and their families to be working together to a common set of goals. And that's ultimately, I think, how, how we should be defining value-based payments. Well, if I may add a one point, I, I think if you look at the analogy from taking seat belts, Right. When the people take seat belt, then they're actually more likely to an encounter an accident than people don't have seat belt. So sometimes to have more skin in the game would help. So right now we have a system that is very much believing that more, more expanded insurance is always good. That is really good from the provider or the manufacturer of the device you know, perspective. But for individual patients, that's not necessarily a good thing. No, let's say right now we give cash distribution to financially disadvantaged individuals and ask them to use the cash to buy, just like a retail market, some routine services and not you know, low cost services. And then they understand if they, if they let's say they don't control you know, their, their blood pressure or that other things that are within their control, then they're gonna spend more money from that pool, which they can use for themselves or for, for their family members. So the thing there, that will change people's action. So I think that is something we lack at this point, the empowering patients, that people take more responsibility and use some kind of cash uh, subsidy and, and giving the power to patients, use that to improve health equity. That's interesting. Um, I, I guess uh, there's another question and I, I wondered if, if Dr. Dugan wanted to start it off with, you know, how basically do you bridge the transition to value, especially, I mean, um, I think, you know, we all realize how much investment has gone into the status quo. Um, you know, 
So <clears throat> how do you incent um, hospitals or you know, providers to actually um, you know, shift their view to value um, when there may not be really a huge financial incentive for them to do that? Yeah, uh, so I guess, good question. Um, you know, one of the things I would say is the fact that, you know, transitioning from one system to another uh, is difficult because many organizations have aligned their level of services and anticipated volumes based off of, off of how they're reimbursed. Um, the idea is to really focus on increasing um, or, or, or obtaining the most amount of revenue from, from in large part a system that reimburses for fee for service and, and, and on volume. And kind of making a shift over to a value-based system at present, um, there are a lot of kind of carrots and sticks related to these programs. Um, if you're a high performing hospital that has a very favorable payer mix and you have a population that doesn't have very large underlying health um, conditions, um, it's very easy for an organization to be financially advantaged by moving into or, or being more receptive to more kind of risk-based contracts because uh, they anticipate the fact that they will look good on paper. Um, they already have very low reimbursement, uh, readmissions. Um, they already have very low complications. They've already made kind of large investments in their technology um, through uh, capital raises. And so, um, you know, in a way, it's not as if they're changing the way that they're delivering care per se, but, but they find themselves uh, advantaged by moving from one system to another. Um, and in kind of going back to my previous point, uh, other hospitals that, that in particular are lower resource uh, don't have the advantages of having a lot of excess reserves or being able to uh, fundraise. Um, and they surely don't have favorable payer mix. And so again, that um, hurts their, um, uh, the level of resources they might have to make transitions. And, and when you do deal with populations with a large, uh, a great amount of underlying health-related conditions, suddenly moving to a value-based um, arrangement uh, makes a lot of these institutions look bad because there are a lot of readmissions, but these aren't attributable to what the medical institution is doing. Uh, this, these are attributable to just systematic underinvestments that the country has made uh, to vulnerable communities and, and communities of color. Um, in public health, we always talk about unmet uh, social determinants. And these unmet social determinants don't just have immediate effects on your ability to eat or ability to house yourself. Uh, they have um, short run and long run effects when it comes to different chronic conditions, whether it's diabetes or, or, or obesity, or even in the long run when it comes to cardiovascular disease. And so um, kind of building on previous comments, when we think about kind of system transformation, you know, it really should be considered like Vivian mentioned, um, people working as a team. And by aligning um, that uh, perspective, I think um, that can greatly inform how we, we, we move forward with the, the idea of, of, of altering the way that we think about value-based um, reimbursement. And in the absence of, of that focus, um, you know, I think there's a role of government to kind of pick up the cost and acknowledge um, the, the disproportionate disproportionate burdens that these um, uh, safety net hospitals and critical access hospitals face compared to, to more um, uh, financially well-resourced institutions. I'd love to add to, to Dr. Vivian's comments too on this and just share a perspective from when I was um, leading the University of Utah Health. And actually your colleague, Gina Collada came out and wrote a story about us uh, for the Times. Uh, on this, which is as we're moving, what are we trying to achieve in moving to value-based payments? What we're trying to achieve is to now reward hospitals for lowering their costs of care and not dropping quality, essentially. That's really what we're trying to get them to do. And when, when I was in Utah in this CEO role, um, I had this epiphany, which was if you want us to lower our costs, we actually really need to understand our costs. Um, <laughs> 
Dr. Bai would know this better than anyone, and you can't really lower your cost if you don't know your cost. And at a, from a cost accounting perspective, most hospitals, most physicians and clinicians really don't know what it costs to provide our services. And so I think that in order for health systems to be successful, to really go into value-based care contracts and, and uh, be successful in this model, they have to be able to manage their costs. They have to have a dashboard with some knobs that they know they can turn, they can reduce their overall costs so that they can take on those contracts successfully and not, not essentially bankrupt themselves. Um, and I think we sort of miss that um, in our narratives about value-based payment. We just sort of expect these health systems just to just flip on a dime to a completely different model and, and then question, why are they so resistant? You know, why are they not just embracing them? It's because of a fear of failure and because of the complete lack of infrastructure to be successful in that model. Um, so increasingly, people systems are moving down that path, but um, an investment there, especially in our critical access hospitals and our rural health, you know, places that cannot afford to make those investments, I think is going to be really, really important for the successful transformation. That's interesting. Um, Dr. Shane, I wondered if you could add sort of the perspective in terms of when we were talking about sort of the team approach. I mean, but, you know, in terms of, of you know, what the expectation should be, sorry, for um, your, the, the population at the community side. Yeah, so for, for teams, um, it, it's largely born out of the fact that, you know, you, you try to serve them as soon as they come. Um, it could be, if you think back, you know, if you build it, they will come. And when they come, you want to grab them um, and get them as fully um, serviced as possible on site, um, whether the regular doctor is there or not, but then when they're working with the teams that already know the patient, um, it has some sort of connection with them. Um, and, and really thinking about how to work through um, not only some of their individual behavioral change, but also working through some of the care management plans that have, they have to put together. And that goes again uh, into the EMR uh, as one form of documentation, but there is this, what you call interpersonal um, factors that really are, is one of the biggest values that health centers bring to it. Uh, but also to go back to the point of what value-based payment models might look like for health centers, um, it's sort of similar in that, in that vein. A lot of health centers are now already under capitation or get a capitated rate. They do the, the monitoring and things like that. But I think in terms of value, there is this huge social determinant component that has to be addressed because you're not going to push much of the dial further without being able to think much more about not only the patient social determinants, but we're talking about community social determinants um, and really investing into the communities so that you can really impact population health uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, for, the, for many of those low-income communities and communities of color. Thank you, this is fascinating. Well, um, thank you, everybody. What a really interesting conversation. You know, I think if there is one sector which should have an inflection point around COVID, it's the healthcare system. And uh, I think you've all given us much food for thought. When I talk about COVID these days, I'm often asked if I think things will change. And uh, my answer is generally, I hope so. And, uh, and I actually think it, uh, at the moment, has given us all pause, but has also pointed to areas which can truly be we can pivot on in a way that we could not put before COVID. You know, there's no way to redeem the tragedy that was COVID, but if we don't learn from the moment, then we're really just sort of deepening the tragedy. And I think uh, you all have given us food for thought about how COVID can be the kind of moment where we can actually move to a better healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you to the audience for being a part of it. And thank you all of you for 